uh, recognizing some staff that are important to all of that here at UES, Stacey Herbal uh, in our drinking water program, uh, Shane Shiki in our, uh, our, our US, in our groundwater or our geological survey, uh, John Pasquale up in our uh, MTBE Bureau uh, and our industry flow and watershed staff, lots of other DPS folks who feed into this process. So um, that is really important for us as we continue on as an agency to make sure that we're coordinated internally, given that so many of our programs are dependent upon having ample water in the state. So given that we have starting to have more and more of our internal meetings discussing where we were uh, and doing these drought updates as they became more and more sort of uh, uh, severe uh, in, in what we were recommending, we figured it'd probably be good to get everybody back together and talk through some of the other uh, effects that we're seeing around the state. Uh, we get asked a lot because of the work that we've been doing on the drought. We get asked about other sectors and hesitant to reply uh, because we think that's better for you. So again, we're going to get rolling here and uh, to talk a little bit about the current situation uh, and the weather and uh, how this fits in with uh, this year's uh, climatological situation. We have our state climatologist, Mary Sam So come on up, Mary, and talk to us a little bit about uh, what you're seeing. So uh, this is just a little bit of a summary of kind of how we got to where we are. And so if we go back to June, um, you'll see that the abnormally dry area, which is kind of the pre-drought stage, actually developed uh, pretty much over the week uh, or the last week of June. So throughout the month of June, most of the state um, was under no, no drought conditions, and then the abnormally drought or abnormally dry stage developed in that last month. With and there was a, just a sliver of uh, moderate drought that had developed uh, in the south. And so regionally, I don't have a regional map up here, but regionally the drought kind of started uh, in a southeastern New England and kind of moved north and west from the coast over the uh, summer. And so over the course of the month of July is when the conditions really started to deteriorate. And so within a couple of weeks, we saw the um, spread or um, intensification into uh, first category drought, which is moderate drought. Uh, in early July from sort of the southeastern part of New Hampshire on um, west and north through early July, while the um, original moderate drought part intensified in southeastern New Hampshire to a severe drought. And then things kind of stabilized during the middle of the month, and then after all of the um, heat that we had the last couple weeks of July, um, we saw more intensification throughout the state. And so just for reference, a uh, climatologist would consider this a rapid onset drought conditions because it was only a few weeks that we went from abnormally dry to um, the severe and moderate drought phases. You may have heard this referred to as flash flood as well. Right. And just to kind of look at how precipitation uh, has accumulated over the past two months. So we started June 1st on the left and moved through today on the right side for, um, for five representative stations here across New Hampshire. And you can see that uh, the pattern is pretty, uh, pretty much the same statewide. Um, this time of year, so the month of June and July, we would average about statewide about four inches of rain for give or take, depending on where you are locally. And we've um, been anywhere between 50 to 75 percent of what that average value is across these past few months. And if you look at it, there's been actually about the same amount of precipitation or rain in June as there was in July, but it fell differently. So in June, we had a lot of the rain kind of happen earlier in the month, and then we had a fairly dry period, which is when we saw the onset of the abnormally dry drought category. And then in July, we see a lot of uh, kind of more frontal or convective um, precipitation, so you get those bits here and there, rather than kind of a, a larger rainy pattern um, that we tend to see in the uh, cooler months. And so kind of keep this uh, precipitation pattern in mind, and then we combine that with the temperature. And so one of the reasons why 
rough conditions were kind of slow to develop during June and didn't intensify as much during the month or as much during the month of the review. But because June was actually cooler, we were about anywhere from normal to a degree Fahrenheit below normal through the month of June. Whereas in July, um, particularly in the southeastern part of the state, we've been anywhere from one to three degrees Fahrenheit above normal through the month of July, and July is just hotter anyway. And so what we've seen happen is this increase in the evaporative demand from the atmosphere and plants during the month of July uh, that has actually exceeded the anywhere from two to three inches of precipitation we received statewide, um, which has allowed that drought to intensify rapidly over the you know, four months of um, for the four weeks of the month of July through to now. And so what that's done is led to extremely dry soils. If you are a gardener and you've dug around in your garden, you'll notice that the top layer is pretty much just at this point. And so over 50% of the state right now has top soils that are classified as very dry by the CDC. And of course, we're starting to see um, significant impacts on vegetation across the state. And so we'll look ahead, unfortunately, for the next month. Um, it's more than likely that we're going to have kind of the same conditions going forward. So over the next few days, we have some precipitation uh, forecasted statewide, but again, we're just going to get a pop-up showers. So now we need a real sober, and that doesn't look like we're going to get that over the next week. And then if we look into um, sort of the two week out, so by the middle to end of August, second to third week of August, we're going to um, expect again. You know, pop up showers here and there, or like the cold we saw in July, but um, these are above normal temperatures. So, while we're going to get some rain, um, that's not going to be enough to meet the atmospheric demand for um, evaporation. We also have um, soil or uh, precipitation deficits in the six to nine inches across the state, so we have a lot to make up for. And then going through to the end of the month, um, precipitation looks to drop down below normal again. So we can probably expect to see some more dry periods combined with high heat, leads to again more adaptive demand and a greater um, dry uh, pattern. And so um, for basically the rest of the summer, probably into September, um, we can expect to see these conditions at least persist. And I know there's some talk in southern New England right now with the drought monitor that um, they might be expanding or intensifying the drought categories further south. And this whole event has kind of moved from south to north, so um, you could see some intensification. Um, but of course, fortunately, by the time fall comes, temperatures cool. Um, we tend to get a little bit more rain. We have more of a storm event as opposed to just looking back there. So hopefully. Um, by fall, things will improve and the drought out for fall and does indicate um, probable improvement uh, during the months. So that's where we are now. And we questions. Oh, yeah, if you want to do questions. Sure. You go back to the slides. So you're saying it's the sea goes in the answer of where a moderate drought. Uh, we're not going to get second cuts on our hay, but, but I mean, you're getting out that dark color. I mean, is it catastrophic if it roll over at that point? I mean, I, I would consider the seacoast to be answer uh, our farm fields in that category now. Well, if the seacoast is actually in the severe drought, and if conditions persist like this, I, I would expect that the um, extreme drought, drought category will hit that extreme drought category before the growing which I don't think we have growth season. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I know from my own experience that things are really, really good. And I will say on top of that, that I know there's some differences between how the surface impacts are compared to the groundwater. I mean, we can talk more we'll about, 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 about groundwater later. Are we getting any questions online? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I think that gives us a very good summary of uh, how we got here. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more as we go in about some of the other factors that we're seeing, and it kind of goes through the water side real quick. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to you all who have information, like Chris just mentioned, about agriculture or about you know, uh, other aspects uh, of our lives, fire and such, um, so that we can understand a little bit better about, again, that, that broader picture of what drought impacts are looking like and where we see this headed. So I'm going to go this forward here. So I'm going to talk a little about stream flow. And I always like to make sure that when we talk about drought, we're talking about different kinds of droughts that affect the state differently and affect people in the state differently. We have soil droughts, which we certainly just talked about in terms of the, the, the lack of rain and, the, and how deep that drought goes and the dryness goes within the soil, it affects fires, it affects growth of plants, all of those kinds of things. We have kind of a river uh, drought, and this affects our surface waters, and you see you know, different effects going on in our rivers, effects on, re on recreation, effects on the ability to have water, uh, to get out fires, fire ponds and such, and then the effects on fishing and, and uh, another wildlife which are dependent upon, upon. And the third kind of drought that we have in the state is a groundwater drought. And so these things are obviously connected because they're all related to precipitation. But they happen at different scales and have different impacts on uh, the communities uh, that, that depend on them. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that now, is, is that there really are different ways to ponder this idea of drought and, and, and where it sort of sits within the landscape. So we're going to start out with, with uh, a stream flow. This is a curve which, which I think is extremely helpful to use, but it takes just a second to explain. And what you see are the various different colors of those, of those lines are accumulations of different parts of the state, different regions. And so what our, our ACE uh, data guy, Ken Edwardson, has done on these is basically taken the various different regions, added the various different G, uh, USGS uh, gauges together, especially those that are, are mostly unmanaged sites. That is, there's not a lot of uh, upstream uh, management of water that's changing those, those or making those fluctuate or, or moderate. And so what you're able to see here is you can see each one of these uh, days along the bottom is really looking at comparison to, to average uh, flows over time, or basically putting all of those flows on a scale of zero never percent never happened to 100 percent happens all the time. Uh, the 50 percent is just sort of a median, uh, little sort of a median condition. So if you're looking at process, what we see for pretty much uh, most of the state, certainly in June and July, is that all of those curves are very low, like in the 20, 20th percentile or so. And a lot of them dip down into the 10th or, or even lower. So these would be like the 5 percent lowest flows that we've ever seen for that particular day over history. And so this really helps us to understand where do we sit, not just as uh, a particular gauge in a particular place, but helps us really look across the state in the way that we think about regions. And so what you can see from this is that the Southern Connecticut, which is the yellow line, you know, has been pretty well juiced by the various storms that have come through recently. That's certainly helpful for that part of the state, especially what you're going to see uh, when we start talking about some of the groundwater wells. But you know, the rest of the state, you're seeing little bits, little, little blips here and there, but in general, it's been a downward trend in the state of that, that, that low spot. So this is just a statewide picture of what stream flows are looking like. And if you're into, if you're really into the data, this sort of gives an even more interesting uh, picture of it, because what you can see are each of these different uh, parts of the, of the state, and you see that the Southern Connecticut Valley appears to be doing sort of pretty well. The coastal Piscataqua area is doing is really rough. And in fact, if you put a you know the median on there, it's down around five percent uh, of historic flows. The Saco is pretty tough. North Woods have been hanging in there right about ten percent. And huge variation in the Merrimack Valley. And you see this. We were talking about this before the meeting. So you can see huge variations between sort of what's going on, say, uh, in, in the rivers like around Concord, I was looking at the Warner, the Warner looks actually half to decent, versus the Kachika, which is extraordinarily low, historically low right now. So this kind of helps to, to uh, put that into perspective. 
I appreciate USGS. Uh, thanks, Richard, for sending this over. This is really helpful to understand this difference between sort of uh, what's managed flows and what's not managed flows. If you just went and looked at the gauges, aggregated all the gauges on the Connecticut on the Connecticut River, you would get a pretty a picture like you see the, to the one on on your on your left there. It shows it pretty green. It looks like flows are doing pretty well. That's really uh, mimic what that what that is showing really is that those flows are highly managed because the whole northern part of the Connecticut River can't. So it doesn't really indicate the actual flow conditions that we would see in that area. You start to take those out, those unmanaged sites out, and you get a much better picture which shows that um, most of the Connecticut is actually very dry. And when we talk about groundwater, you're going to see that in particular. We have a program called the Instream Flow Program, uh, which we initiated uh, a couple of decades ago. And there are currently uh, three rivers that have protected instream flows that have been calculated and been tracking on a daily basis. Two of those, we actually have management plans for those watersheds. That's both the Lamprey and the South Keegan. The other river is the Cold River, which we have protected in the process of writing management plans. And there are two other rivers that are cur currently going through this process, the Shwelet and the uh, and the Water River. So what you're seeing here, this is for the Lamprey River, and at certain flows, we have management uh, management plans, and they kick in certain actions. Some of those actions include conservation. Some of them are are changing where your water supply actually comes from. And some of those are releases. We do these pulse releases from the tucked away and end up that help to augment and re sort of reset the ecology in those rivers, taking a very small amount of water out of those lakes, releasing it. It mimics a two day rainstorm that would normally provide that pressure that we just haven't had this year for most of the rivers in the state. So you can see that right now we are very low below our protected instream flows, that river, the, the red and yellow line. And so right now, in fact, there's a, 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 a pulse release going on in the lamprey, which will go on for the next 48 hours or so. The idea is to pull that up again close or hopefully exceed that, that protected flow. The Salhegan also is starting to look, uh, it was looking okay for quite a while, uh, recently took a dive. And so we're starting to see that, that those management plans are coming into effect on the Salhegan. And then finally, the Cold River, which has been much, much better and has seen a lot of, you see those storms that has been highly responsive to uh, this year. Um, it's also starting to get into kind of lower flood conditions. So we are seeing this moving from south kind of up to north. Uh, so looking at our groundwater network, we have a fantastic groundwater network that's been built over time. Uh, and, and our geological survey, the geological survey manages this. Uh, they go out and, and check these water, uh, check the, the water levels in these groundwater, and some of them are overburdened, some of them are down in the bedrock, and it gives us a really good picture of what's going on. And what you can see here is that all along the Connecticut River, we have very red dots. <laughs> Those red dots mean they're very low. They're very low by historic terms, not just low for some of the wisdom, for some of the uh, They're low historically. And you can see that also in some of the seacoast region and a little bit in the middle of the country, a little to the state, uh, Hampton, all the The really dark red, the darkest, darkest of the red, uh, or the brightest, brightest of the red, that uh, would be the lowest flows, the lowest average flows uh, measured for that particular month at those particular wells. So not only are we seeing very low conditions in some of these wells, which have data going back you know, a few decades. These are historically low conditions. So that's a concern for our drinking water resources, our groundwater resources. And the state is currently uh, in a process of augmenting this network and also um, automating this network, which we're very excited about. Uh, anything that I missed, Shane, or uh, on, this, on this issue of groundwater? Good. And I'll stop pause for questions. If there's any questions or, or uh, Things that came out from the chat. Nope. That won't stop. I'll keep going. Uh, this is really, uh, when you start parsing this out a little bit, what you see is that what I was kind of, uh, th this idea that we have different kinds of routes and that hit in different kinds of places for different reasons. So you see um, 
you know, I think what's really interesting is you look at like the, the Newport well, uh, which is this this one down here, uh, this one down here. And what you're really seeing from that Newport well is, uh, you know, really lack of, lack of snowpack. It's really been dry all the way through, never really truly recovered uh, from uh, the, the droughts of 2021. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, this is one aspect of drought, sort of groundwater drought, in which there are areas of the state that still really never recovered from the deep droughts that we have. Again, historically deep droughts, probably the deepest drought since the 1960s that occurred in 2021. And then you see sort of these Kingston, which was doing quite well, and that sort of shows what this idea of a rapid onset drought. And this came on as the conditions deteriorated, um, you know, and I think Hampton sort of uh, sits in that as well. So you see this, this rapid deterioration this year based on several factors. Low snowfall last year, which affected some place, antecedent conditions, that is the conditions that were occurring prior to this year, and then those dry conditions that we've had now. Again, that influences the different conditions in the different places in the state. Also shows what a diverse state we have for such a small for a small state. Uh, this is from our Dandro. Thanks, Jim Gallagher, our, our state engineer is here. And so uh, what you see is that uh, Winnipesaukee is running uh, what a few tenths uh, below normal this time of year. Then you can see that what we see in the precipitation data. Uh, this is our precipitation. So you see these lows. Uh, sort of accumulating over the course of, of July. And you can see here that um, where the, the pink is, uh, is, is the inflow and discharge is the, uh, is the green line here, that you're seeing pretty consistently over the past month that our inflow is less than uh, our discharge. And so again, this is why you start to see the lake starts to go down. There's not a whole lot we can do about that given the inflow conditions and the minimum flow requirements that are necessary. Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I just thought, that thought, probably just speaking of head, illustrate what Aaron was talking about, that last six weeks we had a long period of negative uh, in that sort of process. You know, it was trying to compensate based on late flow and based on uh, what we know is going on Right. So you see, anytime that we have uh, the, the pink line is below the green line, it's, it's there's more going out and coming in. Excellent. Any other questions on that? And are the lakes around the state are kind of in a similar condition? Uh, not really dropping tremendously, but we still we're starting to see some lower flows or lower levels. Um, and then kind of, so what's going on in the state around this, uh, we do track the, uh, the, the different water, water sources, water supply systems that may be implementing uh, restrictions. That could, those could be odd even day restrictions or morning night restrictions or even watering uh, or watering bans. Uh, we track those and so we've been tracking this all, all through the summer. At the beginning of the, of, uh, at the end of June, before things started really uh, kind of unraveling from a drought perspective, there were uh, about 50 systems or so, and they're affected about you know 60,000 people. And those are systems that have annual problems. So, so almost regardless of what the weather conditions are, there are a number of systems around the state that have challenges during the summer uh, maintaining enough water. So they almost always have some sort of outdoor water restriction. But what you see is really the expansion of by about 130,000 people over the course of July that are now under some sort of restriction, mostly in the south uh, eastern part of the state. And you can see that that's affect 67 different uh, systems around the state. In terms of private wells, and if there's any private well folks uh, who are here, uh, we are also starting to hear about problems. And uh, our Gray Barker, who runs our uh, well water well program, he uh, reported back to me that he inquired with a number of different uh, water uh, companies who provide wells. 
And there are a couple of things just to, to note from that. One is that they are hearing from people, probably on the order of we're hearing maybe up to 100 or so dry wells um, around the state. We also have gotten direct uh, notification of probably around 10 uh, dry wells. Again, sort of th these are wells that have, uh, this has occurred over, you know, really just this summer. Um, and we're also hearing just from the well drillers, um, given the rapid development that's going on, given the number of uh, seasonal homes that are converting, all of the, the real estate development that's been going on sort of the post COVID boom here, um, the well drillers are, are, are very delayed. Uh, and so they have long wait times on often. So, so this is a challenge uh, related to our you know, private well systems is that people are going to be stressed. And one of the interesting things, again, is that the droughts have hit different parts of the state at different times in different ways. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing some parts of the state, such as uh, in the, that, that Connecticut River Valley, which haven't seen as deep a droughts as, say, the North Country saw over the last two years. And so you start to see these wells going dry in different places that we may have seen in 2016, or we may have seen in 20 or 21, which is also sort of interesting to the peculiarities of how precipitation falls across our state. So um, we have developed a program, which I'll talk about in one second, that it provides help for low-income folks who may be suffering from wells that have gone dry. Um, that is this, our wand program. And this, uh, this is here, this came up uh, over the last couple of years, we developed this in order to provide assistance to low-income uh, families in the state who may be having problems with their wealth. Oftentimes, these are dark wells or shallow wells, and so they need help with trying to get them deepened, or they, you know, because of that deepening, they require different kinds of treatment. This is a program that will uh, be able to be available to do that, and there's gonna be a press release that's gonna go out today after this meeting which begins to make sure people are aware of this. The well drillers have already been notified about this because they're usually the first point of contact uh, with someone who's having you know, problems with their well. Um, you know, they say you don't know the value of the water until the well goes dry. Um, so there's definitely some people learning that value. And so we're hoping that where we can, we can help. And if you go to the website, uh, the, that's the Groundwater Trust program that they will have information, application materials, as well as the eligibility uh, materials necessary. So we encourage people to, to please go and look if you are having problems with your well, if you know people that are having problems. And if any of you have thoughts about how we should get this information out to other service providers who may come in contact with people who are having a problem with their well, we would love to know that. So please shoot us an email, shoot me an email, um, and, and we'll be able to use that information. So I do appreciate any help we can get on that particular issue. So I'm gonna stop there for a second, actually, uh, before we go on to sort of our key messaging. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to open it up to anybody who has information that they'd like to share about what they're seeing and hearing around the state. And I'm gonna do this sort of in a sector by sector manner. So I'd like to start out with um, our good friends in the agricultural community. Uh, Rob, I'm kind of staring at you. Do you have anything you'd like to talk about? Uh, go ahead. There's a, a microphone right there for you, Rob. Food growers, vegetable growers, are irrigating And you just uh, remind us who you are, Rob. Rob Johnson. Chicken wheels, salt and Right. 
Okay. Any other um, words on agriculture that you're seeing from, uh, from your, as we say, yeah, if you could bring the microphone up here, that'd be great. Thank you. I know this is a little bit of a pain with the microphones, but it helps the folks uh, who are remote to be able to see. Hey, thank you. I'm Jeremy Lyle, UNH Quadrant Extension, I'm a field specialist. Uh, I reached out to several farmers last week, late last week, just to kind of be the latest. Um, definitely want to reiterate what Rob said, uh, but just add a little bit of detail from some growers. A um, couple of examples. One grower actually worked with NRCS last year to expand their pond. Um, the hope was that that would get them through September. So that's 2019 uh, during the last drought. It was an opportunity time to do that. Um, and then that well is, or that pond is dry now. They're also hauling water. And that's Hollis. London Dairy, one of the largest vegetable farms in New Hampshire. They're using hundreds of gallons of diesel per week to keep the pumps running. Diesel is not cheap right now. Um, so they're going to likely suffer, suffer yield losses. Um, the field crews are actually being released early on some of the hot days, which means loss in productivity for those farms. London dairy, pumpkins could be a total loss in unirrigated fields, definite size difference in triple irrigated versus unirrigated apples. Size on Macintosh, for example, is much smaller. <clears throat> A lot of ponds are to the bottom. This farm in particular is transferring well water to the pond to keep the irrigation running. New Boston lost two plants and some carrots due to drought. They couldn't keep up with the watering demands. They're using lots of fuel. Uh, bright spot is that insect pressure is low due to drought. Just take where we can get it. Yeah. Uh, Concord uh, crops we can readily water are okay. Some irrigated crops are definitely impacted by. Poor growth, small size, low yield. These are direct quotes from farmers, by the way, I should say. Uh, ponds are going down, growths are very low, tree fruit with no irrigation is suffering uh, on size. Bottom line is this will impact uh, crop volumes and ultimately income. Apples in Lebanon that are hauling water to spray uh, from five miles away. In this case, an insect called European red mite is exposed, partly due to dry conditions and heat. Um, they, they can keep up with water demands. It sounds like Sullivan and Cheshire and Grafton uh, basically are reporting just lower than average hay production. Um, second cut was increasingly down, lots of irrigation happening. Um, that tends to be what we're seeing. Some of the heat impact, we are seeing some flower portion on some crops, especially. Uh, those are going to be high tunnels, cucumber, tomato, when you get those temperatures up in the you know, high 90s, you know, when that are not able to properly ventilate those tunnels. And sometimes, even if they are properly ventilated, those temperatures are still going to be bad. So that's your report. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Big shout out to the Agricultural Experiment Station at UNH. Uh, thank you very much. I know you folks keep your, your ear to the to the ground and um, are, are doing amazing work of preparing uh, new crops uh, that can be uh, be planted by farmers in the future to, to deal with these very issues. So um, happy to uh, to get better associated with you all. It's, it's pretty fantastic the work that goes on out there. Also one of the most gorgeous spots on earth, quite well played. Um, so any other any other words from the uh, agricultural sector? Uh, anybody want to uh, to know, or did we get anything in the chat from anyone from the agricultural sector? Great. Um, anyone from uh, forests and lands? Thank you. Uh, Steve Sherman, I'm the Chief of Forest Protection for the state. Um, so as far as uh, forest fires, um, what we've been seeing is uh, things of definitely burning the uh, conditions that we typically don't see even on a dry summer until late August, um, early September. We've been in those conditions um, right through July, uh, the seasons. The fires we've been having, uh, the remote fires, uh, just burning early, uh, one, two feet deep. Uh, as far as water goes, so far we haven't run into any fires at any locations that we weren't able to get a water source. 
um, or at least have one close enough that an anchor shuttle uh, was effective. Um, but you know, as things continue, that's usually what we'll start to see is uh, we, we won't be able to tap into streams to get a hose lay in um, for easier water source. Uh, but right now, that's what we're looking at um, with the outlook going into September like this. Uh, that's not great. Um, so we'll expect that the fires are just going to continue to be those one to two, three day fires to put out. Um, and I'm just talking, you know, that could be a half acre or one acre fire and state in three days to extinguish. So I have a question for you is given the uh, extraordinary fire conditions on our, uh, on our other coast, uh, the, the left coast of the United States, um, what does that do to the number of firefighters that we might have available here? Do we, are we ever sort of at a demand uh, or supply issue with those, um, with those folks who, who might be deployed outside to other parts of the country? We, we do deploy some of our own firefighters uh, throughout the country, especially as the uh, national demand picks up and the national planning level is expected to bump up uh, the southern area and this increase as well. Um, we will start to hold our own folks back uh, from going on assignments throughout the country based on our own fire danger here. Uh, and where it could affect us. Um, is if we have a large incident and we require assistance from outside of the area, it could affect the amount of firefighters available to come and assist. Um, the Venus fire we had in profit auction May, it was 106 acres, and we had firefighters from uh, West Virginia out here. Uh, so it could start to impact that. Right. I'm going to have you come back in just a little bit and talk to uh, the messaging. Um, that we should be getting out to people about forest fire. But let's continue with the impacts a little bit, and then I'd like to come back around and talk about that um, here in a little bit. Other forest impacts uh, that uh, people want to share from from their their uh, perspectives. Go ahead. I'm facing you I'm with the White Mountain National Forest and. I think we're not seeing the, the fire related pieces, but obviously uh, also seeing increased stress, increased issues, uh, increase in insects and disease, and especially those that can be affected. And especially focusing on species like fungi moths that are often controlled by a fungus. When they say that they drive the fungus, let's control their forest. So, some of our areas, especially if you were showing the Saco, are getting sort of double whammy of both um, impact from the, you know, the spongy moth is hitting, so we're getting less tree foliage, which is then allowing the drying to get more you know, sun and heat to hit the ground more, which is then drying out the plants in the understory, increasing the fuel, things like that. So it's, it just sort of continues to, to build an increase in one of our impacts there is looking for rare plants, which is not in that area. And so if it needs some canopy cover over it, it's often in these areas that are currently affected by that economy moss. So those species are getting more stressed. Um, we're also finding when it comes to controlling our invasive plants, the interior of drought, the herbicides that we may use are less effective because the plants aren't that you know, they're, they're shutting down due to that drought. Uh, just some sort of long term effects that we may be feeling as well. Great, but I could ask just one quick question on, uh, for you. Sorry. <laughs> um, it, do you feel like that the forest, I mean, just given the dry conditions that we experienced in 1920 and 21, especially the northern part of the forest, um, do, do you feel like you kind of got full recovery after that uh, with the rains uh, in, in the last, last summer fall? Or, or do you still see some of the lingering effects? Well, you still see some of the lingering effects just because the trees and other species are in different. Ages of development, nutrients, 
we've seen those species carry cover for a year or two before we start having three or four. Great, thank you. And we'll come back to you in a second again and talk a little about what, what advice you would give to people visiting the White Mountain National Forest. Um, other forest uh, forestry impacts that we want to talk about. Um, and I don't know if we had anybody from Fish and Game to talk about sort of fish impacts. I know um, the director is planning to be here, but he said he was going to be late. So we'll maybe come back around to him unless anybody on the chat or anyone else has uh, any thoughts on, on fisheries. Okay, uh, we'll move along. I have just uh, one update and then we'll move to sort of other. If there's anyone else who'd like to talk about um, impacts that you're seeing from your sector uh, that you're interested in, uh, we did get a, an, uh, an email from uh, Jessica Keeler from Ski, New Hampshire. Um, and right now, they're basically just keeping an eye on the drought situation. And so far, you know, none of the areas are expressing, none of the ski areas are expressing concerns. So, um, you know, the, they're really waiting to see what happens for the snowmaking season. Uh, they're really uh, anxious to make sure that we get enough rain in the fall that uh, there won't be any shortage or restrictions during the winter uh, for snowmaking. So that's the concern. Um, and in fact, you know, over the last couple of years, they know one resort who had to buy water from a local precinct uh, when their own sources got so low. So, you know, I think that that's from the Speed New Hampshire perspective, we're really hoping that we start to we have that recovery in the fall that we certainly saw last year, which was quite beneficial. Plenty of water from the ski areas last year that was great. Any other uh, impacts or kinds of uh, you know, drought related items that you all would like to bring to our attention. Anything else you see uh, in the data or, or information you have? Okay, great. Oh, wait, Brian. Data. So, that we know on the data. <laughs> well, I'm going to say, uh, Brian Gatz, uh, City of Portsmouth. So, uh, one thing that, well, uh, I hate having these meetings every other year, but uh, it seems to be kind of more the norm. Uh, so our numbers, I know the Seacoast spends that show up uh, in every drought to be the highest level of drought. Um, so what we what we noticed and what we're tracking is out of the last ten years, we've had, we've been below normal precipitation. Either. Um, and the years that we just got enough precipitation, they were just normal. So I think to some degree we're a little bit swayed by the fact that the early 2000s, we had a Mother's Day storm, we had all this wet weather, um, sort of skewed us into the thoughts of how much water we had and flooding and things like that. It hasn't been the case the last 10 years, but, um, you know, we're. I don't think we're as bad as we were in 2020. And then we look at the calendar, we we're only a month away from Labor Day, so chances are we'll, we'll all make it through. But it, it is the long term, it's the deficit that we continue to experience over and over. And maybe we'll get a, a storm, maybe we'll get a hurricane, which we really don't want to replenish the water. But if we get it, we'll take it. Uh, to some degree, what well, we need to recover from the, the deficit. So um, I know that systems around us, we're at our, our water systems, we only have voluntary restrictions through management. We've been uh, pretty good. Our valley reservoir is down uh, a foot, but not as low as it was in 2016 or 2020. So again, we've got markers to be able to compare. You know, historic droughts, 2016 was. was Really, really dry 2020. Uh, a longer period of dry, but not quite as dry. Um, so, I guess we're kind of third in line at the moment, but you know, it's all what happens in the future. So, um, I, I think uh, some of the other systems around us have done not even. I know Rye Water District has done that, Exeter has done that. Um, systems that maybe are more impacted by irrigation. And I think anybody in the room that 
that things not even works. It really doesn't. People, people here, they can still irrigate, so they still irrigate. Um, you know, so if we get to that point where we really need to do the restriction, state power, and you, you elevate odd even to you know all restrictions for the long water and pretty quick. So Brian, I think on spot for just a second. Um, can you talk a little about what enforcement has done to improve its drought resiliency over the last, uh, you know, few droughts? Well, we we have both surface water, groundwater. So when we have the surface water, we shut our wells down or, or we reduce the amount of withdrawal. So we're able to turn the wells, in, which is essentially water and storage, cut back on the surface water. Um, so that, that has helped us to some degree. We've optimized some of our um, sources. Uh, we, fortunately, through treatment of PFAS, at the moment we have a well online of feeds that we haven't had online for the last seven years. Um, behave a lot. So that, that's, that's quite helpful um, to have that source back online. Um, and we fixed leaks in the system. We probably upwards of maybe a half million gallon of water we used to into the pipes that would leak out. So you know, all those things have added up and we've messaged our customers we've got a uh, toilet and uh, washing machine rebate program. We, in the last seven years we issued 1,200 rebates. So we do see a reduction there on a day-to-day -day, um, consumption uh, on those users. Not huge, but it, it a little bit adds up. All of it. it's, a, it's a compendium of things, but it takes a lot of effort, time, and it is, it would be nice to get a break. <laughs> That's all I can say. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. Any other uh, our water suppliers? I won't, I won't put you guys on the spot, but I know that you're seeing things seem to be okay here in the central uh, part of the state. Um, that they're, you're thinking, you know, supplies are hanging in there, Manchester, Concord. Um, so, unless you want to say something, um, very good. Okay. Um, any? Oh, yeah, Joe. So yeah, one, one reminder. Of, yeah, go ahead. Just wait a second. For the reminder for those who don't know, in case folks don't know, the drought also impacts water quality, and in particular for private wells. Um, recently, we have evidence that drought conditions lead to potentially higher concentrations of arsenic in your things like that. Just like a deeper wells on average have higher concentrations of those as drought ensues and water table you know, elevations go down, concentrations can increase. So just something to watch for if you're in the area that's prone to that. And did you, did you introduce yourself? I'm sorry, I'm um, Joe Hayot with the U.S. Geological Survey in New Hampshire. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, really good points. I think, um, you know, we're going to get around with some messaging, but uh, you know, maybe that's one of the messages that we ought to be uh, portraying to folks is that, um, you know, if your if your if your well is getting very low, then perhaps you ought to think about doing another water quality test, which you can do right here in our state. Um, so, uh, Director uh, Director Mason, uh, do you have anything to add about uh, about fish or other critters uh, that we ought to know about? Uh, <clears throat> I am an executive director of New Hampshire Fish and Game. Um, we've had two fish kills this year, which is not as normally high for us. Uh, probably go through the warm water conditions. Um, but as of now, um, as I was talking to my biologist on, on Friday, um, the drought kind of started a little later in the year, so we missed the reproductive cycle of a lot of our, our species. Um, and then as long as the drought gets done and we have water back in that will help some of our other species uh, hibernate this winter, uh, it, should, it shouldn't have a huge impact on, on wildlife, I can say. Um, should that change we go into, you know, if it, it, it continues, mean, we've seen the water levels drop a lot in a fairly short period of time. Certain areas of the state, if that continues and we don't have water levels back in, that may have some uh, def detrimental impacts on some of our turtle species and reptile species. You know, we need water coverage when they go down. So right now, that, those 
fishing with other aquatic wildlife are sort of hunkered down in deep spots. Is that the basic? Yeah, it, um, you know, it, it may be some impact, but. Timing is everything for us and for us and the species that we're interested in, uh, timing of the trail and good so far. Seems to work with us or work against us. And I'm just going to trouble you one more second that I know that you also are a farmer from up in the northern part of the state. Uh, do you have anything to relate from you or your neighbors up on the uh, upper Connecticut? Um, well, um, yeah, for those of you that don't know my background, uh, my wife and I. I actually married into it, and my wife taught me how to milk cows and drive tractors. So um, it's certainly been a, a, a wonderful marriage for over 30 years now. Uh, but anyway, uh, my wife and I uh, ran a commercial dairy farm until a little over a year ago when we sold out the cows. And we're still currently running uh, beef, sheep, vegetables, and um, uh, forage crops. Um, as I was saying to Ted, uh, when we talked about phone the other day, uh, for multiple reasons, I no longer farm today the way I did 30 years ago when, I, when, when we bought the farm up north. Um, we, we modified a lot of our processes and a lot of that, whether we do it at the time or not, a lot of that actually had to do a lot with the uh, changing of the climate and, and how that impacts things on the farm. Um, I won't go into details, but you know, when I was in college, we were taught to mow in the afternoon or the evening. That's when grasses had the highest content carbohydrates, and that's what you're trying to capture when you make hay or made silage. Uh, but we, since then, in order to, and when you get rain, some of you know anything about hay, you'll understand that rain is not, we want rain except from the time we cut to the time we fail. That's a very bad time to have rain. So in order to um, reduce our uh, exposure or our weather risk, uh, we've all changed the way we mow. We actually now get up by, you know, I'll get up and start mowing at 3 o'clock in the morning, especially for, for silage. It used to be silage is a two day process. You mow in the afternoon and you chop the ball in your head. Now we're mowing in the morning and we're all done by the evening when we're chopping um, silage. Um, when we move into a dry hay, we still get up and do an early morning mowing, um, but it's still taking um, probably, I can get a little bit, I can get a little earlier jump on it. Uh, on the third day, but I'm not, I'm not able to use it yet in two days unless, unless I'm really fast and really tough. Uh, we've also uh, mitigated how we change our tillage practices. Uh, when I first started, I was a conventional tiller, a lot of tricky on a mole bottom plow and uh, arrows, and uh, those, I haven't touched the mole bottom. I can't remember the last time I used it, but it's sitting up on my neighbor's place now. I haven't only been on my farm in 10 years. Uh, we switched over to no-till, um, and the beauty of no-till, first of all, it saves fuel. If anybody wants to price of fuel, that's a, that's a good thing. The other thing that we've done with it is uh, <clears throat> by not disturbing the soil, we're able to get money on the springtime when we do have some rain. Um, we can get on the soil a little quicker, and on the land a little quicker if we haven't tilled it. Um, and the other thing is, is that in a dry year, we don't lose as much soil uh, moisture to evaporation. Um, so it actually is a, it helps us in both wet and dry. So there's been a lot of changes, and I think that just about any farmer you talk to will tell you they, they're changing what they're doing today. And quite often, a lot of it has to do with uh, you know climate change, as well as costs associated with agriculture. Now. Uh, it gets a little tougher and, you know, difficult. A lot of your farms down here um, are uh, more on the vegetable fruit side of stuff. And uh, wouldn't be really qualified to talk about uh, any of the changes that those folks have seen. I'm sure they too have gone through it. I know um, irrigation practices changed over the years, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that recognition from all those perspectives. Uh, and so, um, unless there's any other folks that want to talk about potential impacts or have questions for those people who've already spoken, I'll pause there. Yeah, go ahead. Steve. The one piece I didn't get, not to like how you were going to divide up your, your sectors with our rec speech, recreation, and so for us, please. You know, you just spent quite the time that was at the beginning of the pandemic, which is probably not a surprise, but still, heavily high. 
Uh, and, you know, needless to say, the lack of rain and really great weather, and such there's a warmth that pushes people up and up. There's, there's no place else. Um, but what we're also discovering is that, well, we all know that a lot of rain is bad for the trail. In terms of dry, it's not so good to get that dry tumbling. There's a certain amount of nature you need to hold rocks and dirt in place when you've got a lot of feet trampling along and, and, and moving. And so, we actually have a number of our trails that are just, again, so that I can only describe it like that by humbly, where there's a lot of use. And then when we get these two inch, you know, inches, two inches of rain in a dump, that is what we seem to be getting, you know, that's when that stuff can actually move. So it's interesting to see that when I'm used to thinking of the other intense rain we had in the earlier time. Great. Why do you only want? I'm going to go ahead and change gears, and we're going to talk a little about mesquite. So, um, for folks that are visiting the White Mountain National Forest, you've identified a couple of different uh, impacts that, that you're seeing: the impacts of insects, the impacts of, of dry conditions, um, and potentially on fire, which we heard about. So we'll go to that in a little bit, but also on trails. So, what's your advice? Uh, what, what messages would you like to get out to folks? Who are visiting the White Mountain National Forest during this period of time? So many. Uh, <laughs> you know, messages that particularly relate to the drought, the folks coming yes. out of those. Um, you know, obviously, I'm sure we would be very interested in the out there fire and make sure that it's um, And that, that, you know, often people think it is and they don't think around. Uh, and then the other part, I guess, is just because rivers and streams are lower right now and you can cross them, doesn't mean that in future years that will be the case, or even that when you're on your way back out, that it might be the case. Get a, a heavy rainstorm between the time that you cross the stream going in on your hike. And when you're ready to come back out, be aware that at that point you're going to be really different and perfectly safe crossing in terms of your surroundings. Again, that's in that way. We want everybody to be able to back out. That's terrific. I appreciate that. Certainly the flashiness of, uh, of the mountains in New Hampshire in terms of the precipitation and water levels is it's uh it's pretty pretty intense because there ain't a whole lot of soil up there. Uh, sits on top of the rocks. So that water's got, got to go someplace pretty quick. So we're going to work backwards then. So uh, we're talking about fire, if you don't mind. Uh, go ahead and, and talk. What's your message to get out to the good people in New Hampshire and our visitors uh, about fire? Well, we want to make sure that everybody's getting a fire permit. Um, that's one way that we can prevent uh, issues from occurring is allowing fire departments the ability to issue fire permits. So if there have certain areas that are experiencing uh, more impacts from the drought um, or recreational activity, they can uh, determine whether it's safe for people to burn in those areas. So we want people and encourage people to get the required fire permit. Um, and then just to echo uh, what's been said is putting fires out. Uh, we've had uh, campfires in remote areas, uh, even last week, which are just burning real deep because people aren't putting it out. So putting water on it, stirring it out, and then feeling to make sure it's out is easy. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, and, and again, we'll talk a little bit. I, we already heard about some of the resilience uh, activities that are going on in our water supplies. Uh, and, and also within our farms. Um, is there any other messaging, say, from UNH Agriculture Experimentation that is going out um, to your, you know, to the folks who you serve? Uh, what messaging are you getting out to the agricultural community? Yeah, so the main thing, and, and Rob did touch on what I want to make sure I did as well, is just that, you know, our farms have, have already laid out, you know, a lot of expenditures. They've spent a lot of money up to this point to see them to grow the crop. Um, it's really important in years like this that we get out to the farm stands and that we support the local farms. Um, they need to get down more than ever. So, you know, any effort that you can make, if you want to see, make it to your local farm stand. Um, that's great. It's more than any metal, but 
Um, they certainly need their support during this time. So um, that's important to get out. And then on the issue of just conservation of um, the water that we do have, especially irrigation water, you're talking about uh, changing trends. New Hampshire farmers are starting to utilize things like soil moisture sensors quite a bit more to make their irrigation decisions. And so that allows them to kind of you know, place the sensor in the ground, get a reading from that. It's likely multiple sensors across the field. And so then they've got a number on that soil moisture. And it kind of, uh, once they start to learn that soil based on their soil type, that can allow them to trigger the irrigation response or potentially say, I don't need to irrigate today. Um, I can go another day. So that goes a long way towards you know, making it drop as far as possible. Uh, we're seeing a tight in automation as well in certain cases. So I think you know the future is bright as far as water conservation and agriculture. A lot of major farms are already taking that um, on themselves and implementing those practices. And, and is there technical assistance through the cooperative extension programs on that? There is, and we have a fact sheet online um, on utilizing soil moisture sensors on our, our website um, and um, uh, the conservation districts and NRCS have also been big proponents of that. And, uh, when they're designing the irrigation plants, oftentimes they're required soil moisture monitoring equipment to be installed with those irrigation systems. Great, excellent. Uh, so, in terms of other messaging, I'm going to quickly cover kind of what the messaging is coming out of our department, and this mirrors some of what we started with Mary Stamphone. Uh, is that we are basically we're in a drought. It is given the given the forecast ahead of us, uh, it is likely to intensify moving from south to north. We have particular concerns about groundwater levels in the Connecticut River Valley. Um, and so we're, we're really talking, we're making sure that people are aware that those groundwater concerns are out there. And we would expect some intensification of the drought uh, in that area, again, depending on what happens with rainfall. Um, we don't expect a major improvement. Um, obviously, stream flows are highly re reactive to precipitation, but soil moisture conditions, how deep this, the water goes within the soil, and the um, and, and then getting and actually recharging groundwater takes much longer time and much more sustained uh, water uh, precipitation. So we don't really expect to see that until fall. So our key messaging is that uh, for water suppliers, if you're beginning to see problems, please start to communicate with your user uh, that they need to start doing conservation, whether that's mandatory or voluntary conservation. How you choose to do that. Uh, ramp, we will be DES ramping up our messaging on that uh, issue as well, particularly in those places which are in severe or hopefully we don't get into other categories of the drought, but if we do, again, we'll be intensifying our messaging. And then this message of conservation. Um, and then I like the other things you've heard today, be careful with fire, put your fire out. I remember when I was in Boy Scouts, somebody had to go fish around with their hand in the bottom of that fire pit. Um, it was always a little shock when you, when you got one of them coals. Uh, so, you know, but it's worth it. It's worth doing. Um, so, you know, that's really important. And be careful when you're out about, uh, you know, hot tail pipes on, on ATVs, other things like that, just given the current conditions can, can go pretty quickly. Other messaging that we should be getting out to, uh, to folks uh, through, uh, through the media sources or through our drought outlook that you all would like to see. Anything else? Terrific. Anything that showed up on the chats? Great. Uh, yeah, let me get the microphone. That's Jana Ford uh, in our public information programs. I'm Donald Peterson from the NRCS. Said that NRCS will have a fly with smart funding tool this year to help farmers install practices that deal with drought and stream rainfall events. Can you say the name of that program again, Jim? Uh, NRCS. I know, but what's the name of the, the program that they said they're starting off? Um, Great. Excellent. And then a uh, message from Jeffrey Holmes. Um, the other four weeks of YouTube and Cheshire Historical Drug County. Would be eight total weeks will trigger separate material disaster declaration requests for drought in this county. Also, reported crop, I believe, losses of at least 30 percent for any given crop coming by will lead to disaster declaration costs. 
That's a very good point about the disaster um, you know, declarations. That's really key uh, for federal funding. So we'll be keeping track. I have a feeling we're going to start keep, keeping track of that here as well, so that we can make sure that we're you know letting people know where we're at with that. Uh, so I appreciate um, I appreciate the USDA for chiming in on that. Chris, yeah, just wait a second. Let's get a microphone over to you. You want to just introduce yourself, Chris? Sure. Uh, uh, Chris Albert, uh, CSA Environmental Consultant. Uh, I'm a water system designer, septic designer, work with scientists. So I, I kind of feel under the, the one water approach. Uh, we're in a drought today, but I think we really need to look at uh, client resiliency and, and really looking at uh, flood control structures along the seacoast. And we've got to get ready for these larger rain events. We need to take a water harvest approach of, of storing that water. Uh, look at what Durham did at Spoo Street as far as you know, pumping water back into reserves. Uh, we need to learn to start harvesting our water. These ups and downs are not going to change the sea coast. Uh, so hopefully the commissioner, you guys, can look at different ideas on how we can we can take those major two-inch rain events and then try to hold that water back for that dry condition coming up. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Chris makes a good point that we should probably talk about when we're talking about our climate is that we also don't have a good storage. So, um, you know, we're not like California with giant uh, reservoirs. Although their reservoir is pretty empty right now, too. So, uh, maybe we're, no, I don't know, whatever. So, the, uh, where we are in this is uh, any last, uh, sort of recommendations for the next steps. We heard about some good messaging, we heard about some assistance programs. Um, any other assistance programs that people know about uh, that we should be aware of and make people aware of? Great. If, if people have thoughts like that, please email them over so that we can try to keep track of some of that. Make sure that people are aware uh, where there are uh, programs that can be helpful for them. And where I'm going to end this is that um, what I intend to do is uh, with this, with, after this meeting, and we'll, we'll send out, uh, we'll be developing a little bit of a summary of this meeting. Uh, we'll have it posted on our, uh, in our drought website. Um, this will help to inform our draft updates. Uh, that's what you get from Stacy. Uh, and, and if those of you are on that list, and if you're not on the list, uh, shoot us an email and tell you how to get on the list uh, for the drought update. Um, or you can always just go to our webpage and, and, uh, and Google the drought. So that'll get you there. Um, and then, you know, I think if we would continue uh, where we are like this for uh, much into the fall, what I will probably do is gather this group again uh, sometime maybe uh, end of, probably like towards the end of September, if things are still looking rough, so that we can get people back together again and see what sort of um, messaging or preparation we should be making uh, in thinking about what happens over the course of the winter and into the next year, if this turns out to be a multi-year event. So that would be my, my uh, intention. Any other thoughts? Uh, from anyone here assembled uh, who would like to make any uh, recommendations about, about future opportunities or future things that we should be doing to make sure that we're all coordinated as a state. Okay, you're shy. Uh, you can go ahead and email me later, ted.deers, the IDRS at dps.nh.gov. And um, Please, if you have any thoughts or uh, other things that we should be talking about, please let me know, and uh, we'll do that in the future. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, adjourn this meeting. You're, feel free to stay and commit as you like, and we'll um, uh, be around here for a little bit if people want to talk or if you want to talk to me uh, specifically about, about issues that you have. And otherwise, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, and thanks for the input that we got here today. I appreciate it. Take care, everybody. And don't forget to drop your pretty nice.